Okay, welcome back to stage number three for a Deutschland premiere, a German premiere of a movie. And the movie will be introduced by the maker of the movie, um, Oxford Ruffin. He's with the cult of the dead cow. Um, and he will introduce the movie himself. It's about cybersecurity and civil society in India. Please give a warm welcome for him and the movie. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming, and uh, I'm very grateful to Republica for uh, extending this invitation. It's a very great honor. Um, I think uh, probably the best way to introduce the film is maybe tell you just a little bit about myself and how I ended up in India and started working on this film. Uh, about 12 years ago, I was uh, based in Munich, and I was working for a crypto firm there. And Uh, just through the daisy chain, I managed to uh, be invited uh, to be part of a delegation uh, advising the Tibetan government in exile uh, in Dharamsala on um, sort of network development, best, uh, best practices for developing their networks there. Um, and that led to a few more visits, and I uh, met the local technical community. Uh, And there were a lot of very interesting people there, not the least of which was uh, an Israeli guy named Yehel Ben David, who had been working, experimenting with, at that point, uh, Wi-Fi development, router development. And when the law changed in India to permit uh, Wi-Fi networks, uh, Yehel, you know, pretty much put up the first, uh, I think, like within one or two hours, put up the first... Uh, Uh, node of what began to be a community wireless uh, network, Wi-Fi network in Dharamsala, which turned out to be the first uh, uh, community network in the country. So it was a lot of fun being involved with that. Uh, eventually, or four and a half years later, uh, I moved to Dharamsala and was there for three years working with the community and doing a number of things. And 14 months ago, Uh, I moved to Bangalore and became associated with the uh, Center for Internet and Society uh, and was commissioned to do some interviews uh, with lawyers, activists, um, policy analysts, uh, these kinds of people who are sort of, you know, topic area experts in things like privacy and surveillance. Um, And we started just with a series of interviews that were going to be edited down to about 10 minutes apiece and uh, put up on YouTube and form the beginning of a discussion uh, about civil society and cybersecurity in India. Now, eventually, a narrative started to emerge from this, and we thought, okay, we'll make a documentary movie. Uh, so it's something that came out of another project. Um, We have uh, three, uh, three short documentaries, two of which we'll be able to see this evening. Um, the first one is on uh, privacy and surveillance in India. Uh, the second is uh, anonymity and free speech. Uh, the third one, uh, which we're winding up, it should be done in about a month, is on uh, human rights and technology. Um, and all of this will, when it's eventually Uh, released on the internet. Uh, it'll go out under a Creative Commons license. You can get it from the Pirate Bay or <laughs> whatever download sources we can arrange. Uh, and hopefully people will use this footage. They might recut it. They might use it in their own projects. And we're hoping that it's going to be the beginning of a, a larger project and a broader public discussion. So I think uh, if we could start. Uh, the movie is about 40, 41 minutes and we'll have some discussion afterwards.
I don't like this sort of cliche that Indians simply aren't private, that as a nation we're not private or as a culture we're not private. But um, I can see that maybe the things that we consider private and public are different. Maybe the line between the private sphere and the public sphere might fall somewhere different from where it does in the West. But I, I don't believe that we're not private. Privacy exists in uh, different forms you know, and at different levels of abstraction. Uh, if you look at the Indian sitting uh, situation today, offline, there is no privacy. Uh, you could have a credit card verification guy who comes to your house and asks for a whole lot of information, writes it down on a book, and you don't know what happens to that book or to that guy who came to verify your credit card information. So, uh, to a large extent, uh, privacy, generally speaking, in India just doesn't exist. And I think that kind of gets to what might be different about India. Maybe the things that we consider private, we may not consider financial information private, we may not consider passwords or ATM pins private, we share them in a collectivist kind of way, the way we share a lot of things within families. But I think there are certain things that we would consider very private and that the invasions of which we would consider transgressions. Privacy is not so much dead as much as it is accessible by a certain group of people more easily than by others. So the more privileged you are, the richer you are, the whiter you are, well, the more male you are, etc. It's easier to, uh, to have a certain access to privacy and related rights than others. So it's a paradox because it's possibly needed most by people who are not able to access it. So I think even when you look at the case law in India, it very much develops from this notion of bodily privacy, which derives from the right to life, the right to live with dignity. You know, when people are incarcerated, do they lose certain rights? How are they to be treated in prisons? And most of our privacy jurisprudence starts from that point of view of the body as a private space. And the notion of information or data as being private is something that's only slowly um, being taken seriously. It's, you know, a slow sort of, um, transition towards that. So I think the notion of what is private and what might not be private is is still in flux and is developing. And I think with the kind of regimes where um, that the state is implementing, where people are being documented, where biometrics are being taken, where all kinds of big data projects are being rolled out, I actually think the notion of privacy is going to get even more finely grained than it used to be. The way a lot of us live our lives in, in is to somehow divide it into different spheres and these spheres may overlap like my personal life might overlap with to some extent with my family life which might overlap with my work life but there's a lot of information that is only relevant and only in those parts and i think a, a surveillance mechanism or something like even the unique identity project or any kind of nation-based either surveillance project or, or databasing project disturbs that way in which we live our lives and disturbs that precarious control that we have over the kind of information that we want to share and where we want to share. I think it's assumed some other form and I think it's actually more important than it ever was. I mean, I think privacy in some ways might be dead, but I think the value of privacy might have changed. I don't think privacy is dead. And if you are living in a democracy, then privacy is very, very essential to maintain the health of the democracy. People already think that, you know, yes, on paper we're a democracy, but are we really when votes can be bought, when your rights are transgressed in every way, where the rule of law or the lawlessness of things make it so difficult for you to protest anything, where that sort of kills any desire to protest, where people subvert everything, your democracy is pretty flawed to start with. This is a very complex issue, but at the end of the day, what is the state? The state is meant to protect the citizen. Now, if the citizen's rights are going to be violated by the state in the name of, say, combating terrorism, then I think that is a failure of the state. Ideally, if you're looking at security for the citizens, then you have to develop processes which are competent enough to protect the citizen without violating the rights of the citizen. And this has been well debated over decades. And, and most progressive democratic societies have now more or less 
agreed and codified the fact that privacy is as important an element of the security of the state and the citizen as much as say combating terrorism. There is always a tension between the public interest and the individual's interest. So I don't think this uh, inherent tension would be any different when it comes to the cyber uh, when it comes to cyberspace. An individual will have to trade off a part of his uh, privacy and his freedoms, online freedoms, in order to have online security and offline security as well. Uh, so what I think is more important is how that tension or how that, uh, that dichotomy between uh, security and privacy is negotiated in a democratic republic. Is it, is that uh, balance handed down by tradition? Is it handed down by fiat? It is handed down by an opaque group of people who make the law and say this is the balance between security and privacy or is it negotiated as part of a wider public discourse and democracy as a whole provides an answer to that where that balance should lie. You know I think a lot of policy makers in India don't seem to uh, buy into, they seem to think that the technology allows us to constantly monitor, they allow us to constantly surveil, and as storage becomes cheaper and cheaper, yeah, let's just collect everything and worry about it later. It may be relevant. An aspect of cyber security is to protect privacy. For example, if somebody were to hack into your uh, personal data or even your official data, isn't that supposed to be uh, an issue of uh, 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 secu cyber security and if that is the case then how can you dissociate both of them? The Indian government doesn't encrypt its own data and we're often seeing documents leaked by the Indian government so I'm not sure they're in the best position to advise other people on how to use technology but um, if they want that to be real and have some teeth they need to change the laws around encryption strengths. We have the weakest encryption strength that's allowed so if you know, so pretty much people turn everything off. Well, Indian government takes it as a right to intrude into citizens' lives and does not offer any counter protection. And as far as judicial oversight is concerned, it has not even thought of. See, initially, most issues of legal phone tapping and interception, wire tapping, and most issues of uh, cyber in, uh, interception are in many ways mandated by a 1996 Supreme Court judgment which mandated that if you are going to tap, conduct wiretaps then there has to be a certain process in place. So having done that, the current situation was that for example the ISPs, that is the internet service providers and the telecom service providers, they, would, they were mandated to set up centers in their facilities where everything, whenever a legal requirement would come they would at the switch give you this kind of data based provided that it has been duly authorized and so on and so forth. But recently they have found cases and instances where there has been leakages from these kind of uh, facilities. So the government of India therefore decided that we need to centralize everything and ensure that these kind of leakages don't take place. So they created what is called the central monitoring system. It's a huge multi-million dollar project where everything will now come to one single source and one single depository will of this information will be created and a audit trail will be created through digital means where whoever requests first it will be validated whether it is a valid request and all the processes are foreign play through and if they have taken place then th that particular data will be shared. The government of India and its agencies have not shown any uh, competence, great amount of competence in the kind of surveillance they carry out, in the kind of techniques they use to maintain internal security, or indeed to form the kind of laws necessary which would balance privacy and, and national security. So the first question we ought to ask as citizens is, is the com government competent enough to carry out its responsibilities in an information age? There was this really terrifying spreadsheet where it was a list of about 161 people who had been threatened, abused, physically um, harmed, and actually died. So it was this whole gradation of actual physical harm, um, where in the process of seeking transparency from their government and accountability, their own privacy was compromised and sacrificed, and their 
being visible in the context of making these claims and of asking these questions, which they're perfectly entitled to do in a democracy and under a statute that allows them to do this, they were physically at risk. The danger with such a system here is that this works in a system where we have complete faith that the government will not misuse this data. You have prevented private players from misusing the data. But now what safeguards do you have of the government that because everything is being done in an opaque manner. For example, even questions under the Right to Information Act about what the architecture is, answers are being denied on that on the grounds that this will threaten national security. I fail to understand how national security is uh, compromised if a system which will facilitate lawful interception is discussed openly and it should. So since this is a completely opaque system, A, we don't know what the safeguards are and B, since we don't know what the safeguards are, we have no idea whether this is being misused at all in the first place. Unlike a lot of other countries where threats are external, I actually feel a lot of threats are internal. You know, we as citizens are exposed to far greater threats from our own government snooping on us um, than anybody else trying to hack into Indian systems. So, um, I actually think the framework of law plays a very important role in either enabling um, surveillance or enabling security to be handled in a certain way. And I think the law can be a block or it can actually free up space. And I, I, I don't see how you can divorce technology from the legal and social and political environment in which it functions. Usually my experience and history tells us that once a power is available to an entity, whether it is the government or a private body, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when you are giving this kind of a power, minus safeguards or questionable safeguards, there is tremendous potential for misuse. Yeah, I, I think as with a lot of things, where you are sitting has a lot to do with your view of the world and I think if you are sitting in a government seat, your view of cybersecurity is probably everything is a threat, whether it's external, internal, domestic, international. Um, there is a sort of paranoid view of what cybersecurity is intended to tackle. Um, but I think, as an ordinary citizen or a layperson, you may not distinguish between an external threat or, you know, a government attempt to hack into military databases or, you know, to get government intelligence. I think that you may often feel that your security is compromised by a legal regime or by certain statutes that allow a certain kind of surveillance or censorship or that, you know, say for example, if you have very low encryption strengths that are legally permitted in India, that impacts what you as a citizen can do to secure your communications. So I think it, 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 it has a lot to do with your definition of cybersecurity and what it's meant to tackle and what the, your threat model is. The, the disturbing part about surveillance and, 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 and databasing, or broadly perhaps technology more working towards the interests of the state rather than my, you know, my pleasures and my projects or my interests is precisely that, that I lose that precarious control over how I share my information, where, how I lead my life, what is available, what is known about it. I think there are different notions of surveillance. Um, you have this whole, I mean, you have the whole Big Brother analogy and the whole panopticon and, you know, when everybody is watched, do they behave differently? When you know that the jailer has complete visibility of everything that you do, you know, the Foucault notion of it and the uh, Bentham notion of this panopticon where uh, everything you do is visible and therefore you think before you act, you think before you speak. Um, that's a very powerful metaphor in the surveillance sphere. But I think that's often quite a misleading metaphor because it implies that you know you're being watched. Whereas a lot of the surveillance that takes place nowadays is invisible. You don't know that you're being surveilled. And if you don't know that you're being surveilled, um, are you really modifying your behavior because of it? If you don't know that it exists, is it really impacting you? Is it really creating a chilling effect? 
yet it is happening and there's all this data being collected about you and decisions are being made that you're not aware of and is that actually um, scary? Actually, to be very honest, uh, Indians are quite clueless about how much personal data is being collected and in how many forms because many of these forms are now being done in a manner which seems very innocuous but all the data in the end is ending up with one single repository which is the government. So therefore there are huge issues here which Indians are mostly unaware of. People ignore privacy policies, people click through terms and conditions um, and therefore websites are designed to get you to disclose more and more things. And I think that's something we're not really aware of in India where the surveillance takes place. More and more Indians start using the net for the first time. They're not quite sure of the etiquettes of online behavior. We used to call it netiquette in the good old days. So if you see a lot of new users behaving in ways which we find strange, it's because they've not been sensitized to online etiquette. Online patterns of use, how do you uh, work with others online, how do you treat others online, how do you deal with strangers, and a subset of that is how do you protect yourself and not harm others online as well. So part, a large part of this is to do with civic education, online civic education, and of which uh, cyber security, privacy education would be a significant part. But I think we should look at it more of uh, a, a way to sensitize the online uh, Indian or the online public onto the norms of behavior online, and then the rest will follow. If you just abdicate responsibility for your privacy and your free speech to some amorphous, you know, altruistic uh, notion of what governments and corporations should do, you shouldn't then be surprised if they, they don't take those things seriously. And I think users should be doing a lot more uh, to protect how they interface with technology. A magnificent strike into the crowd. India lift the World Cup. Firefox, Opera, Facebook, ya Chrome. recollection of using a computer? Um, I think I was 12 and in primary school and we used to have these option between you could either choose lessons in typing where they because typing was a skill which was being taught in schools once upon a time or you could opt out and take computing. I'm kind of often very confused with what it means to be anonymous, right? Because anonymity, for example, presumes that there is an identity which first needs to be secure and preserved and then you need to perform something else which does not betray your original identity. Uh, and in that way, it's not about just being, it's not just about the value of anonymity online, but the value of anonymity as a social currency, what does it help you perform might be a more interesting question to ask, for instance, right? On the one hand, it's not that, you know, your, your, your being online and your presence in a way in a virtual realm, you know, dematerializes you from all of your identity traps, including that of gender. But at the same time, I think, and this is where one has to look at the early histories of the internet. So in the multi-user dungeons in the early days of the internet, one of the greatest kind of you know, games that was played was gender guessing. So for example, I remember being on Lambda Mu in 99. And at that point, the surprise that somebody had when they finally figured out after six months of talking that I don't live in the US, that I don't go to an American university, that I live actually in India, 
and encountering those first neo colonial questions of are you in india really how do you speak english and my general response used to be through my mouth how do you speak english it was kind of nice to have this almost real time looking interaction um that was possible and that for the longest time you weren't even sure if the person you are interacting with what geography they are from and so on because they were not polite questions to ask This is Doordarshan News. Good evening and welcome. In the headlines, Finance Minister says austerity package will not go against the interests of the working class. Centre convenes conference of chief ministers to discuss issues relating to basic minimum services. Awami League leader Sheikh Hasina invited to form next government in Bangladesh. China not to sign comprehensive test ban treaty. And in cricket, I think security is a very fundamental. value or state of being for human beings if you think of what are the most disempowering states in your life it's the states where you are most insecure you need to have a certain sense of security um to be able to use the internet to be able to be fearless in what you do on the internet normally laws are made after the effect so to speak after the crime is committed after mistakes i mean that's how law originates so the cyber world being new now who should be the best person or has the best judgment to make laws implement laws and follow laws is it the ministers is it the judiciary or is it the you know uh, uh, cyber experts So I think one need to have discourse uh, and then formulate a mechanism through which you can make laws. Not while the minister is replying. Why? Why is this? Tiwari ji, please, Ravi Shankar Prasad ji, you know the rules, but minister is not yielding. Minister is not yielding, and you are simply saying, no, no, please. If you want, I. I will allow you time later if you want please a lot of the bureaucrats especially people who deal with cyber security come from a very status perspective where the safety and security of the state is the first thing you think of and they see that as their job so that's not my job my job is to first of all think about user perspective of what the stake of people is in these debates different groups just come at it from a very different perspective i think what's really important now though is to ensure that the conversation can happen amongst these and what i think is a pity is that we don't always see the willingness to actually engage in that conversation yet government justified by saying uh, to prevent terrorist act uh, one has to be ahead of uh, terrorist because terrorist can take uh 99 uh you know chances but the law or the law enforcer has to be 100% uh you know uh, uh on top of things to make sure that even the terrorists 99% they fail one time they succeed if it, it is causes uh, major damage to the country because cyber security is mostly conceptualized like that it looks as if security online and privacy are opposite to each other but actually to be really secure individuals should have the tools to make those decisions again themselves and if they have the tools to make those decisions themselves that means they can also decide how much they want to guard their privacy so the There seems to be a contradiction between the two it's only because there is a faulty understanding of what cybersecurity means at least if you approach it from a human rights perspective people ought to know what are the laws and regulations at the same time people also uh, should be uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, whatever they are doing when they enter the cyber world there's not just entering the uh, the country Uh, that you are resident of or rather you are part of the whole world given the political nature of social life in india right so i always grew up saying that thinking that i could speak my mind about anything to anybody unless they can hit me more or less and sometimes also to people who can hit me so there has always been a very vibrant uh, atmosphere at least of expression which is not 
necessarily a bad thing. It's not only a good thing because it allows for, I don't know, the first thing that comes to mind is the hate speeches during the 1992 communal violences in Bombay. But it also allows for people to sit on a park bench in a garden at 4 o'clock in an afternoon and have a very strong critical reaction uh, to whatever is happening around them. And sometimes it can be around celebrities, political figures, India's foreign policy and so on and so forth. So the way I would characterize this is that if you were to look at the relationship between Hindus and Muslims or between religious communities in India, there is one way in which one can see it as a horizontal relationship, where, which are marked by conflict. You may have occasional violence. But there are various ways in which the communities have also learned to deal with each other. Various forms, as it were, of speech that have kind of regulated the relationship between communities. Because now, you have created a juridical category on the basis of which I can claim a certain kind of an affective hurt. But it also becomes one that is memorialized. It enters the archive of the state and enters the archive of relationship between communities. So for me, the idea of the cultural exception to be made for Indians in relation to speech regulation is a very dangerous path to go down in. Because there is a classist assumption that censorship should operate only for an other. The other being the uneducated, illiterate, poor, woman, child, insane, etc. So when we conducted a workshop for the Film Censor Board, uh, the chairperson of the board at that point in time, a well-known actress, told us that while I am all for free speech, I cannot allow it because India is a very poor, illiterate country. If we look at the Indian Penal Code of 1860, there are several provisions which govern hate speech. Uh, first is uh, sections 153A and B, which say that you cannot, re uh, which govern statements made which will incite religious or racial hatred or uh, national origin or... Um, caste or creed or any of these, that statements uh, made under this can be punished. Uh, there's also uh, section 293, 293B which say that statements made uh, with the intention of hurting the religious feelings of anyone can also be up, uh, 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 are an offence. Lala Raspat Rai when asked whether Indians had to be treated differently in terms of, of censorship, emphatically said no. He said he wanted the future citizens of a free India to grow up in an atmosphere in which they were exposed to all kinds of influences, good and bad, and for them to make up their minds. And that was the only assurance of a political kind of maturity that would emerge. It's sad, but a hundred years later, we're still recycling the colonial myths about you know, the native kind of audience or about native stupidity or native excitability. And a lot of that kind of, for me, actually underruns some of the, the contemporary debates about censorship in India as well. I think it's next to impossible to talk about cyber security anywhere in the world without referencing the law. And in India, it's particularly impossible given a certain kind of a historical you know, trajectory that censorship or speech regulatory laws have had. Uh, with the larger question of security of the state. And I think this is important to kind of historicize because much of what we inherit in terms of cyber security issues uh, in their kind of conflict with freedom of speech and expression have a much longer history. If you look at the web of laws that exist that can be used in a way to kind of curb uh, various aspects of freedom on, online, you're really talking about a really intricate network uh, the visible ones of these are things like the Information and Technology Act, etc. But you also have a wide range of laws whose kind of application cannot even be anticipated. See, I think there was a lot of... There's a, Section 66A is also very clumsily worded because there was a legislative intent behind Section 66A, but the way it's been worded, it is so broad that almost any uh, speech can come under one of the provisions of 66A. For instance, you look at section 66A, the first clause, uh, clause A, which says, any person who sends by means of a computer resource or a communication device, any information which is grossly offensive or has menacing character. The second one is 66AB, uh, which says, any information which he knows to be false, but for the purpose of causing intimidation, enmity, hatred, or ill will, 
persistently by making use of such computer resource or communication device. The report on the arrest for a, over a Facebook post is finally out. The IG's report says the arrests of the two girls could have been avoided. The report also says that charges against the two girls should be dropped at the earliest. In their defense, the involved cops say that the girls were arrested for their own protection. Now the report also recommends action be taken against the errant cops. One of the big problems with Section 66A of the IT Act is that it introduces a set of terms which are very ambiguous because th there is no precedent for them. So, for example, like grossly offensive. Now, there is, of course, a public interest litigation at the moment that's pending that challenges the validity of 66A. But 66A has really come and emerged as the specter that haunts communication online in India. And the reason for that is very clearly its blatant abuse in highly publicized cases. Now, on the one hand, these cases have kind of raised, in a sense, a certain kind of a consciousness and an kind of indignation around the misuse of the law. But at the same time, it renders a large number of people extremely vulnerable. The problem is that the procedure is often the punishment in India. Now, we've seen in our own experience as lawyers where when people write to us or seek our opinion on whether a certain kind of article that they're planning to write or a post that they want to make, etc., will pass the test of law, Earlier, we were very confident in giving them advice saying that you're absolutely protected in terms of, you know, 191A. But till such time that 66A is on the law books, I would be hesitant to give someone an absolute clean chip, given the ease with which this can happen. It's way too vaguely framed. And because there have been a whole range of instances in which it was used in a way um, that clearly was illegitimate, um, I think a lot of people have gotten the message that if there is a need, it can and will be used against you. And whether or not people admit that, it will make you think twice about whether or not you will write what you think freely. The second problem with 66A conceptually is the fact that you have a scenario, increasingly, where there is no distinction between the kind of speaking subject there is an assumption of a certain flatness of all speaking subjects. So whether you're a, you know, kind of a media house, or you're a politician, or you're an individual blogger, you're being treated on the same plane, and that's unacceptable. What 79 does is basically it's the safe harbor provision that protects intermediaries from certain kinds of action, but is undone in a way by the IT rules that followed section 79. And here, if you recognize that intermediaries are one of the key players in the environment and in the ecology of speech, then the kind of safeguard that's provided to an intermediary in a way is almost directly linked to the safeguards provided to an individual speaker. I think the, the, the struggle now or the challenge is going to be not about um, letting people know what anonymous speech is about or what conditions are needed for it, but in fact trying to understand now how do we perform new kinds of anonymities when we are online. Google receives requests from the government to share you know, information about its users. Now, here you have a situation where, as an intermediary, even if it does not want to, and if it is subject to legal compliance of this form, Google's actions have a direct impact on the individual. Now, till now, this issue has been seen primarily as one of regulation between the state and the intermediary, or between Google and the government of India. Now, what we really need to do is creatively think of ways in which individuals begin to assert this as a much larger kind of a structural question of speech in which companies and governments may sometimes conflict but very, very often collude, risking the rights of the individuals. I think what we will now need is to realize that this is happening, that the act of witnessing, the act of documentation is no longer human to human. That there are a range of other kinds of collectives, artificial intelligence, intelligences, databases and so on, which are doing that particular act. And now you need to safeguard against those kinds of witnessing. If you believe that we need to have a right to privacy, um, and I define privacy as being able to make a decision yourself on how much you want to reveal, then obviously you need to have a right to anonymity. 
because without the right to anonymity, you cannot really have the right to privacy. Because as part of the right to privacy, you have to be able to decide that you do not want to reveal anything at all. So if you would say that we can't have anonymity because it's bad for free speech, if that's a line um, you would take, then I think you're fundamentally undermining another right, and that can't work. If there is already freedom of speech in a democratic country, then the anonymous uh, commentary uh, uh, could be misplaced in many instances. Because the country is democratic, it does have freedom of speech. Uh, hence, the laws protect you from speaking out. Then I think the citizens also have responsibilities, not just that you know, democracy does not necessarily mean only freedom, but it also has duties. That you, you have a duty to say who you are and criticize the government or the employee or the policy, whatever, in your name. Having said that, if that particular country or the government does not allow or restrict freedom of speech, then in that sense, you have no option but to, do, but to be anonymous. For example, uh, in Tibet, even if you paste a poster on a wall saying just two words, human rights, you will be arrested, you go behind bars. If you just uh, shout a slogan, you will be arrested, you will be imprisoned. Anonymous speech will always enhance freedom of speech and expression. Because by definition, someone who's truly engaged as a speaking subject and speaking the truth to power renders themselves vulnerable. And this vulnerability can in a way be offset by anonymity. Greetings Indians, we are anonymous. Currently it has been seen that the governments from various states and the center are in a spree to censor not only the internet but also the right to free speech and expression as declared in the Constitution of India. The fact that there is something called anonymous has always been kind of in a way testimony to the idea that forms or certain forms of speech or speech acts are only possible with the veil of invisibility. Now, there could be a number of reasons for this. On the one hand, it's just about a certain kind of a political courage, uh, where the risks are far too great. In fact, my contention would be that if there were much greater spaces of anonymity, you would actually have a lot more by way of revelations. The right to privacy and the right to free speech have often been understood as kind of distinct rights. But I think in the kind of ecology of online communication, it becomes crucial for us to look at the two as being inseparable. What we need now is a coming together of the two. Where if, for example, you're saying that certain forms of speech are only available and exercisable by you under conditions of relative privacy, then the question of speech cannot be distinguished from the question of privacy. Could we have Could we have uh, some more light? So we have 10 minutes for questions and comments. I just uh, is this uh... I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, we lost the sound on the last bit. Uh, at the end of the credits, uh, one of the speakers came on and we didn't actually hear what she had to say and it was actually one of the f funniest unintended bits of the movie. 
There's the classic story about on the internet, anybody can be a dog, and it's like an old New Yorker cartoon. And this woman was describing that situation. And right in the middle of the commentary, a dog started barking in the background. It was like right outside the window we were filming, so. It's always difficult when you have to explain a joke, <laughs> but that's what happened. So if there are any questions or comments or... Can you um, elaborate on what she was, uh, is this on? I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on what she was saying? Um, um, I forget her name, The um, one of the first uh, speakers about uh, strong encryption being uh, oh, right. illegal there. Um, uh, yeah, I'm actually not uh, sure what the encryption strengths are in India, but apparently they're very low, like almost minimal. So. But is that actually enforced? Like, I mean, if you use standard, like if you just take a normal operating system that has reasonably strong crypto, is that, like, uh, problematic there? It, I suppose it, I mean, without actually knowing <laughs> the answer, I can guess. Um, that there are a lot of laws on the books, and they're used uh, often very capriciously or if you're a target. So, uh, for instance, uh, in the olden days before Wi-Fi was available in India, if you even had a, uh, if you could get Wi-Fi on your own computer, like say in the U.S. or Europe or whatever, and you took that computer into India, theoretically you could have been arrested. It would have been a violation of the law. So this is how the law works. Now, uh, without knowing the actual encryption strengths, you know, if, if people are traveling to India or even local hackers, I'm sure are using. Uh, you know, PGP and, you know, other encryption systems. So I think they're just using them, but if you became a person of interest, uh, then officially you could be charged. I guess the film was very self-explanatory. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no questions... Oh, sorry, one more. Okay, thanks. Um, we have... Uh, what, what, we, what you say is the big difference in, in India and maybe in Europe and in America with this uh, surveillance and this, this debate. Is it just very new for this country or has it a long history or uh, why is it an issue now? Because of, well, maybe it's just for me an issue that pops up now. Right. I'm, I mean, I think it's an issue newly pretty much everywhere. I mean, people who are security experts, policy analysts, maybe politicians, whatever, would have been following this stuff for years. But since essentially WikiLeaks, the Snowden disclosures, this is when it's become more of a, uh, a public issue. So the average person is starting to hear these terms. They're beginning to investigate. And it reminds me actually very much of, say, the environmental movement 20, 30 years ago. If you were talking about the environment 30 years ago, that was almost exotic. You know, the so-called Joe Sixpack, the average person, so-called average person, just it wasn't on the radar. But now everybody, from school children to, you know, like any you know, regular person knows about environmental issues. And I think it's going to take some time for things like surveillance privacy to creep up and become as common as this topic. But uh, in India, it's fresh like everywhere else. And what makes this uh, particularly fascinating for me as an outsider uh, is that, say, I'm not exactly sure of the uh, situation in, in the EU, but in the United States, for instance, um, the NSA uh, does have to, uh, there are FISA courts and there is some oversight. So there's a judicial, although fairly ineffective oversight, and they do have to report to various Senate and congressional committees. Uh, in India, there's literally no oversight of the intelligence uh, communities. Uh, and they're very strong and powerful and have big budgets and they deal with legitimate national security issues. I mean, there's lots of tension between India and Pakistan and 
with China and in the region. I mean, there are legitimate reasons why government have robust, you know, security apparatus. But I, I think what a lot of these speakers are looking at is how these intelligence agencies are now focused inwards, and I think it's about half of their budget uh, now goes to surve uh, domestic surveillance uh, with pretty much no oversight. So this is an area of increasing concern in the country, I believe. I want to know uh, whether you try to uh, talk to people from um, um, which are like uh, involved in this kind of programs, like um, uh, politicians or like, yeah, some uh, governmental people. Right. Uh, actually, no, none of them would appear on camera. Uh, and I have met, uh, you know, like a year or two ago, the former director of the research and analysis wing, which is essentially the equivalent of the CIA, perhaps. Um, he was even unwilling, and he's retired now, he was really unwilling to talk. Anybody who's currently serving in the military or the intelligence communities or politicians, whatever, the, uh, simply you know, won't talk about these issues publicly. Sometimes you can find retired military officers who have a little more leeway, uh, but our focus really was not so much on uh, cybersecurity as a national security issue, uh, but really how it affected average people and what do these things mean to them. So it would have been a little counterproductive in a way, uh, plus like pulling teeth to try to get to some of these people. But it, it would be an interesting conversation, could it be had? Uh, one more question. Um, do you have an uh, idea what, what they are all collecting? So are they just uh, collecting data from the internet or uh, credit cards and cell phones? and? Is it right that they, they have one database to put all this in? or And is this uh, um, agencies or is it police or is, are they separate there or they just collect all together? Um, well, there are approximately, I think it's five or six intelligence agencies in the country and, and they all have different mandates and they're all gathering data. Uh, there's something called the central monitoring system, which basically is a real-time collection of, you know, all kinds of social networking data. So they could take, like, real-time snapshots, and I'm, I'm sure for, you know, like, terrorist events or something like this, it could, it could be great, uh, helping to catch bad guys. But in terms of uh, the data that is collected, uh, all of the... various intermediaries uh, which are referenced, and these would be uh, organizations like, or, or companies like, say, Facebook or Twitter. Uh, the Indian government is the largest, I believe, single request requester of data on Indians, and it's not often given up. Occasionally it's given, but really it, it's, it's fairly rare. Uh, there are also domestic um, social uh, media networks and I think the government simply makes a request and it, it goes and plus all of the telcos uh, and various uh, communications so these are all licensed by the government so if they want something they get it uh, and again like literally no oversight and you wouldn't know uh, whereas say with Twitter uh, they would inform users if, the if there had been a government request or something but in India uh, there would be none of this but I guess the short answer is the government pretty much in India gets whatever it wants and the intelligence agencies are very cooperative and just kind of pick and choose what they want. No more questions. So then thank you again and all the best for your work in the future. Great. Thank you everybody.